Hey guys, welcome back to Tizzle in Motion. And with all the things going on right now with the environmental emissions legislation and National Transportation Freedom Act and repealing things and fighting carbon, all the stuff a lot of you guys enjoy watching my channel for, one of the things that I've seen discussed a lot and people keep asking me questions about is DARA, the Diesel Emissions Reduction Act, and how that fits into the scheme of everything that's been occurring lately. So I dove into it to learn a little bit more about it. And I wanted to bring you guys a video of basically what I've found about it, how the implications of what's happening right now with the EPA and the current administration will affect that. And overall, dispel some of the misconceptions based on actual research I've done and not just hearsay in the chat forums. So buckle up, roll the intro, and let's get into it. All right, guys, let's get into this. The Diesel Emissions Reduction Act has actually been around for a number of years, but let's start with what the goodwill or the good meaning, the intention of the Diesel Emissions Reduction Act was for. So of course, the main goal was cleaner air. As most of you guys know, since the 1960s and the 1970s and the 1980s, there was like that start, that transition uh, for cleaner air, more efficient engines, and it made sense. I believe trucks now are 60 to 80 times more uh, fuel efficient, 60 to 80 times, or not fuel efficient, but less CO2, less contaminants coming out per mile than they were 50, 60 years ago. So that's a good thing. It had its purpose and it's served a great purpose to do these things, right, in transportation. You look at any of the old footage or any of you that are old enough, you remember the skies over LA and places were just, I mean, they're still not perfect, but they're a lot better than they used to be in the old days. So clean air is good, that intention is good and it worked. So obviously this is with a specificity on diesel pollution, okay? So they used to be one of the main causes in the cities of, uh, we had industrial and then you had diesel, right? We have all this trucking going on. So to encourage the cleaner vehicles, the DARA program basically sends the money and says, hey, if you upgrade your fleet, we'll help subsidize that in some capacity, right? Stuff like that. But the there's a negative side we'll get into at the end here, but the, the pollution control devices and the paperwork and a lot of other stuff that goes into it can be kind of a pain in the butt. So how does that impact truck drivers? Well, the good news is they do get newer, cleaner trucks. Sorry, I have itchy eyes today. They have newer, cleaner trucks, right? So those will be upgraded more often, better technology. So they're gonna be constantly dealing with, depending on how you look on it, you know, some people are stuck in their old tricks, but you might get some more efficiency. Now I know with some of these systems and the countdown timers and the def systems and stuff like, I think most of us agree that's just more of a pain in the ass than cool, but some of the technology comes along that makes things better and a little bit more efficient, maybe helps their job. And of course, it's better health for the truck drivers themselves. If you're sitting in traffic all day or you're sitting in a vehicle that's emitting uh, toxic emissions, having less of them around you ambiently in your air, in your atmosphere is a better thing. So it should of course, as you would guess, lead to better health overall for truck drivers. So I don't think anybody's pushing back against cleaner environment healthier truck drivers, more efficiency, stuff like that. Okay, for trucking companies, not as many great things, right? Not as if your bottom line is economics and finance attached to trucking and emissions because you have upfront costs now, right? You gotta, again, all if there's new restrictions, if there's new smog checks, if you will, if there's more legislation, if there's more paperwork, if there's more retrofitting of your fleet, you're going to be spending some money, right, to, to make these changes, and that's not great. Also, you're going to have to strategize if they say, hey, by 2030, you have to do this. By 2032, you have to do that. And you know you're going to have to change out fleet before the end of life of that vehicle. Then you're going to have already stress from, you know, you're coming out of pocket. It's going to eat into the bottom line. And you may not be profitable in some cases if you're a smaller shop and you don't have the capacity to absorb that, right? So... The long-term benefits that they sell on the fleet management is supposedly it should be less maintenance costs um, by having <laughs> one of the things they actually sold was you will have a more appealing brand if you appear to care about the environment. Now, I don't, I don't know a lot of trucking companies. I know two <laughs> personally, small, smaller places. And I don't think either one of them have ever expressed concerns to me about their 
their green energy score with the public. It's about efficiency, getting things moved from point A to point B quickly and expediently and at a good price. Uh, so, I mean, take for that what you will. So again, some of the negatives though, the financial burden, especially on the outset here is not great. Um, the administrative complexity, because you know, especially in places like California, just gonna say it, right? If they don't have a way to bury you in paperwork and taxes and fees, and if you do it wrong, we'll fine you, then it wouldn't be California, right? <laughs> so the bureaucracy of it on top of the added costs, total pain in the ass. And the thing is, they say long-term, you know, especially when they get to EV trucks, don't know when that's gonna happen, but like if that's a goal or hydrogen or whatever, those maintenance costs are less because there's less moving parts, there's less things to go wrong. But initially when you got a fleet that's, you know, 50% diesel and 20% EV, like when they're doing that transition, it's going to be an absolute nightmare to navigate. Uh, it, I think it'll put some people out of business. Plus you got a learning curve. A lot of truck drivers, a lot of truckers and uh, their hubs been doing this a long time. It's in their blood. They know it by the back of their hand. They know procedure. You're going to have a whole new host of brand new problems, especially when we change uh, fuel technologies. Uh, just step one to 10, what you do, whether it's at a way station when you're prepping your load, uh, inclement weather, right? Stuff like this, where your ranges are messed up, problems you can have on the side of the road, uh, lithium fires. I mean, there's a million different things that can go wrong with it, right? Uh, job displacement. What happens when we start putting full self-driving in the, in the, in the semis? What are those guys doing for work? What's their backup plan? How do we reintegrate them? You know, you've been a truck driver for 15, 20, 30 years, and now all of a sudden, oh, not quite right, ready to retire, sorry, but you don't have that six-figure job anymore. So, I mean, there's gonna be a lot, of, uh, <laughs> a lot of things going bad with that. And then disruption operations, because if we don't have a standard thing in, uh, you know, in shipping, like all the ports are pretty much standardized, right? And shipping with trucks right now, especially in diesel, big rig, again, that's what we're specifically talking about now, it's, everything's kind of standardized. But when you have a protocol for one type of vehicle and then another vehicle, that means that shipping hubs, uh, warehouses, everything are gonna to have to retrofit in a slightly different way. Again, cluster, possibly slower in the beginning, more cost to uh, support all these things and not, not all that great. And then of course you have all this old equipment. So what are you gonna do, recycle them? Throw them in the waste? You know, how, how do we, What's the end game for the, the service life of things that are still good, but now you're not allowed to drive them on the road anymore. So anyways, the long story short here is the Diesel Emission Reduction Act, the intentions are great. It has a potential to, I think if it was modified, do the right things. But when you just say you have to do X, Y, Z by this date or this or that, especially with the bureaucracy and the costs associated with it, can turn into a really bad thing really quickly. Uh, with all the motivation, how does this fit in with the EPA's new rules and the Transportation Freedom Act, yada, yada, yada. We won't know till all that comes down. What I can tell you is any modifications, uh, new continuations or stricter rules are definitely not gonna happen under this administration. Trump's gonna veto anything if it made it to his desk anyways. So it could be repealed, it could be changed, it could be mitigated. Uh, but let's just make sure we understand it's a whole different program separate from what the EPA is doing, separate from the Transportation Act, separate from the CRAs, the congressional reviews that are going on right now. Just want to set the record straight for any of you curious people out there. Always appreciate the view and I'll catch you on the next video.